What's good, y'all? Welcome back to the Onyx Report. Black Masculinist News for the day. I apologize for the late show today. I didn't do one earlier than a crazy one. Uh, taught a class with Green Gorilla today. Had to get a lot done. You know, had too many appointments. It was just ridiculous. It was all kind of ridiculous. And then I got sucked into that infamous rabbit hole that is either criminal minds or law law and order waiting for my appointment to show up. And uh, man, I've been caught in a 12 hour rabbit hole with them shows. So y'all know what it is. Hope everybody's well. All right. What's up, Prince Johnny? Uneducated Lane. What's going on? Jay Cleveland. Brandon, what's up? Dardar. Good to see y'all. Good to have you in here. Donnie, what's up? You know, appreciate that support, Dardar. Dardar. Like, share, subscribe, join, and donate if you will support the channel so we can continue to bring you independent black male thought and content that it doesn't have to be filtered through corporate or politically correct means. Y'all know what it is. So last few, few, few days have been pretty, pretty crazy, pretty busy. And brothers have been sending me all kinds of stuff that, um, you know, it's just been interesting stories, articles, videos. You name it, all kinds of stuff has been dropping lately, especially in light of Father's Day. And I'm seeing black men fighting up, fighting for themselves, fighting for uh, their presence in a way I've never seen before. And I salute it. I really do. Um, but it's time to uh, it's time to do what we got to do. We got to put this information out. We got to think about things and challenge convention in ways that we may never have prior. Right. So that said. These are, these are some of the things. Let me show you. This is what some of the brothers have been sending me very recently. And they've been asking me about what this is all about. Right. So in the last few months alone, 2022 has been pretty unique. We had first in February, Black Her Story Month. Right. Unique event. Kind of different. Not the typical Black History Month we you know, are normally acquainted with. And that was quickly followed up with Women's History Month. And of course, in the midst of all of that, you also had uh, Mother's Day. And we had Pride Month, which is, you know, fairly female leaning in the midst of it all, or at least feminine leaning. Um, and then you had Juneteenth. And one of the things that was brought to my attention, and I've had several brothers, uh, some of whom are professors themselves, sending me picture after image, after TV show, after video, where you see this kind of solipsistic, you know, um, self-referencing, right, of black women by black women, right? And of course, this is followed up by the infamous uh, and now consistent argument every year about who Father's Day belongs to. And that's what a lot of this uh, was sparked by. Appreciate the support, Uneducated. He says, uh, I'm on East Coast and not going to make through make it through this one. This is for the collection plate. Much appreciated. Yeah, I don't plan to go this late very often, but I did want to get one in today at the very least, even though it was running late. But I appreciate that support. So as you can see on the screen, these were just random. You know, you can find these all over now. And brothers have been asking me what this is about. And, you know, I've talked about this for years, the kind of self-referencing, the kind of uh, downplaying and diminishing of black male presence both in homes as well as in popular culture and, um, you know, in the, in the, in, in what we might call the, uh, you know, the imaginary. Right. And so that being said, there's another angle to this that I thought uh, really does contribute in a way to the downplaying of the black male presence. Um, and really has a link that takes us back to enslavement. Shout out to Dr. Tommy Curry. Tommy Curry posted this today and I thought it was, you know, it needed to be said, right? Had to be acknowledged, had to be dealt with um, because it was powerful, right? He posted this on his Facebook page. He said, finally found a reference to free black men being a danger to women and children and beating women after slavery, which was mentioned by Bell Hooks and We Real Cool. Bell Hooks asserts with no citation or reference that black men beat their wives in barns after emancipation in 1857, Samuel Cartwright wanted to justify the institution of slavery. To do this, he argued that freeing black men would lead to the abuse of women. This is where Bell Hooks is getting this nonsense from a pro-slavery ethnologist. See Ethnology of the Negro, 
or Prognathius uh, race or Prognathus race, New Orleans uh, Academy, Academy of Sciences, uh, 1857. Let me bring it up because I thought I had it here, but apparently I had not put it on screen yet. So let me go ahead and pull it up. Bear with me for a moment. I hate making you guys wait. And so crazy today. So everything is taking longer than I had planned. So anyway, but this is an incredible post, um, most particularly because of what it highlights. So let me see if I can go ahead and share my screen here. There we go. And enlarge this a little bit. So this is a page it's about as large as it gets right here. Uh, but I will read the section of relevance. So this is a page that comes from uh, ethnology of the Negro or prognathous race. Um, and the, the point of contention, I'll start uh, right here with his reference. And this is Samuel Cartwright. And I'll talk a little bit about him in a minute, but I want to at least foreground what Dr. Curry laid out before we go into it. So when he's talking about the Nigrians, he's talking about Nigerians. Um, he says, or Africans proper, not only enslave their wives, but uh, pave their courtyards with the skulls of the refractory or disobedient wealth and power acquired by the husband so far from uh, elevating the wives add to their degradation by being used to increase their number. The king of Dahomey, according to the most authentic accounts, has 3,333 living wives besides a vast number whom he has capriciously murdered, nor does what is called Negro freedom elevate the colored woman but sinks them lower. The husbands hold them in abject slavery. They dare not kill them as in Africa, but they best, uh, or excuse me, that but they beat and maltreat them in the cellars of New York and other places in the Northern states, which they dare not do in the South. The freedom of the husband is a loss to the women and children. They are in slavery still and have lost their white protectors. That's interesting. So Samuel Cartwright here is talking about uh, women and children being slaves to black men without white protectors. Those white protectors, of course, being slave owners themselves. Now, what Dr. Curry does is he relates this to this piece here from We Real Cool by Bell Hooks. And I apologize, I can't make it any larger um, for some reason, but it is what it is. But she says on page four, and it was within this notion of patriarchy that educated black men coming from slavery into freedom sought to mimic. However, a large majority of black men took as their standard the dominator model set by white masters. When slavery ended, these black men often used violence to dominate black women, which was a repetition of the strategies of control white slave masters used. Some newly freed black men would take their wives to the barn to beat them as the white owner had done. Clearly, by the time slavery ended, patriarchal masculinity had become an accepted ideal for most black men, an ideal that would be reinforced by 20th century norms. Now, a couple things to clarify here. You, do, you need to pick up the man not. Uh, you definitely need to pick up Tommy Curry's man not because that is, you know, that really provides a framework for a lot of this language. But one of the arguments that he deals with in the man not is this question, this assumption, this accusation, most particularly by feminists, that black men seek to emulate white men and thus, as Bell Hooks is talking about here, want to live out a, a white patriarchal fantasy of domination, exploitation, and patriarchal control. Right? This is the accusation that's been levied at Black men for quite some time. But what Dr. Curry has figured out is that those accusations are actually based on earlier white ethnologists like Samuel Cartwright, who fabricated arguments with no evidence or empirical um, or no empirical uh, basis, right? These are the kind of arguments that they pose to frame black men. Now, this would happen again in the 1960s and 70s. Dr. Curry uh, also did some work there pointing out and naming the very specific black feminists that actually appropriated what he called subcultural violence theory or what's called subcultural violence theory, which is in turn an updated version of Samuel Cartwright's work where you have white ethnologists uh, fabricating data, fabricating arguments, I should say, about Black men without using data, and Black feminists, in turn, appropriating that information and arguing it as fact. 
And this has had an impact on us culturally in the black community, especially among the educated uh, white tower elite, because one of the things it's done is pushed for a very particular approach to black men that black feminists have championed. But when, what many of them have overlooked is what Dr. Curry has proven empirically. That is that these arguments are baseless and they actually come as an attack of the, a, an attack to black men, as an attack of black men um, using information that is inaccurate and has racist or, origins. And he just found another example of that today. Um, so y'all know I'm a supporter of Dr. Curry's work, found, uh, founder of Black Male Studies. So this is the kind of thing that scholars in the field have been framing and uh, putting into context uh, for quite a while. So shout out to Dr. Curry, right? Important work that we tend to overlook in many ways, or it doesn't get the publicity it should, because in many ways it frames the relationship that we still have in the Black community on many fronts. Shout out to Brandon, says Dr. Curry is Michael Jordan. <laughs> Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson of Black Male Studies. <laughs> oh, he called me the LeBron. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, Rince Turner, appreciate that support on the wood for greater good. Appreciate that. Shout out to Ghetto User. I always try to support. Much appreciated. You know, but just to also put into context who some of the figures are we're talking about. This is, if you're unfamiliar, Bell Hooks, uh, who passed away uh, a while ago, but. Uh, is known as one of the, the you know late 20th century's most prominent black feminist. She's probably the most uh, one of the most well known, if not the most. Um, and this is a quote from her book Yearning, you know, race, gender, and cultural politics, where she talked about the Central Park Five, right? And so in that, she says, no one can truly believe that the young black males involved in the Central Park incident were not engaged in a suicidal ritual enactment of a dangerous masculinity that will ultimately threaten their lives, their well being. One reads again Michael Dyson's piece, The Plight of Black Men, focusing especially on the part where he describes the reason many young Black men form gangs, the sense of absolute belonging and unsurpassed love. It is easy to understand why young Black males are despairing and nihilistic. And it is rather naive to think that if they do not value their own lives, they will value the lives of others. Is it really so difficult for folks to see the connection between the constant pornographic glorification of male violence against women that is represented, enacted, and condoned daily in the culture and the Central Park crime? And we all know that it was later revealed that those men were innocent. And many of them went to jail um, on grounds that they never should have, right? But this is coming from a black, prominent Black feminist at the time who was talking about Black men and Central Park Five accusations as not only truth, but truth that was reflective of Black masculinity as a whole, meaning that even if the Central Park Five were guilty, they are a small representation of Black manhood in general, right? And even though a lot of people today may not even know about, you know, Bell Hooks' specific arguments or Michelle Wallace or uh, Inosaki Shange or, you know, you can name the list of them, the arguments have snowballed. And they've been appropriated, picked up and internalized even by younger scholars. And this is something I noticed at the university level um, who don't know these works in particular, but have inherited the anger and rage at black men. But when you get to the source, when you get to the earliest stage of that snowball, what Dr. Curry is highlighting is that it actually began with a lie. It began with a lie written by white ethnologists, whether it was in the late 19th century or in the mid 20th century, neither of which was proved with any empirical data. And yet it's taken hold on the perception of black men. Now, in terms of Samuel Cartwright, who Dr. Curry is pointing out is the foundation of, um, you know, this particular argument about black men after slavery wanting to beat their wives and emulate white slave owners. You got to keep in mind, Samuel Cartwright, 1793 to 1863, was the founder of the concept or the uh, he de developer of the concept of draped mania, right? The desire to escape slavery or mental disorder uh, akin to madness, right? For those who fought against slavery, right? So he framed the fight against slavery as a mental illness, right? These were the kinds of works in place. Again, no real empirical research. These are assertions by slave owning white men in positions of authority. Shout out to Jay Will. He says, you let them speak long enough. Uh, they sound exactly like white supremacists. They subtly uh, started their own version of the great replacement theory with their, with their policing of our dating choices. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the reason they sound like uh, white supremacists is because they're actually using white supremacist talking points. They're lifting them wholesale from publications. And of course, now that we have social media, 
from social media as well, right? So uh, Cartwright argued he, uh, that the cure for drapedomania and slaves was to treat them like children with care, kindness, and humanity to pre prevent and cure them from running away and offer frequent whippings. Cartwright also described another disorder, dysthasia at, at Ethiopica, called by overseers rascality, was a disease affecting both mind and body that explained the apparent lack of work ethic among slaves. Right? So this is who Bell Hooks is pulling from when they start to talk about these arguments about where black men must get this urge to dominate, exploit, and beat women. And you'll hear this even to this day. I had a brother reach out to me just yesterday. Well, I get, a, I get about a hundred messages a day at this point. And shout out to those that send those. I, I really do appreciate it. But if you're going to send me videos, you got to tell me why you're sending it to me. You know, sometimes you guys will send me three hour videos and, and I'm like, dude, you give me a timestamp. Tell me why you want me to watch this. I would appreciate it because I don't always have a lot, a lot of time, but I do want to let you know I appreciate that support and your willingness to send me that information. Nevertheless, when it comes to something like this, you know, to understand what's actually being pulled and why and where, like, you know, as I was saying, one of the brothers sent me some of the, uh, the internal arguments to some of these feminist Facebook pages, right, that are closed. And, and, you know, he managed to be in one. And he talked about the assumptions and the arguments made about black men murdering black women in mass, right? These kinds of assumptions, these kinds of, of, of baseless accusations. When you really get down to it, even when you're talking about intimate partner homicide, you're really talking about a few hundred per year, men and women. The numbers are not that far off. But as a good, so a good sociologist friend of mine told me, hold on, let me close these pages. Okay. People like to hit me with messages in the middle of a show. Anyway, um, you know, even in the midst of, of these uh, various arguments. Oh, crap. All right. Lost my train of thought. Anyway. But what I was saying is as far as uh, some of these feminist arguments. Oh, as far as intimate partner homicide. That as a good sociologist friend told me, you got a better chance of being struck by lightning than you do being killed by an intimate partner. You really do. And that's fairly across race. It's, it's really not. It's not an epidemic the way it's trying to be made. And black men in many circles are being made the face of it. But, you know, that's not the reality. The reality is in the black community, abuse is fairly bidirectional and homicide is, is not as widespread. You, like I said, you're de dealing with a couple hundred people a year out of 43 million. Really. But this is the depiction. This is the political angle of this. That's been used by feminists against black men for decades. And this argument really, some of these arguments go back to the 19th century and need to be put in proper context. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that and shout out to Dr. Curry uh, for this brilliant assessment, because in many ways, going back to the beginning of what I was talking about, when we get to this here, this you know unabashed self-celebration this unabashed downplaying of the black male presence in family, the black male presence in, um, in relationships. A lot of it is rooted in very old ideas, ideas that come from lies or uns unsubstantiated arguments that are designed to malign the imagery and memory of black men. And it's continued to be used even by established news organizations, ac you know, academic uh, enterprises, uh, this is a constant in terms of how black men are perceived and it remains such. And it's time black men start speaking out. But the problem has been more so than anything. We haven't had the platform to do it. So actually taking what we're doing and applying it, you know, on a wider scale is imperative. Right? Pushing back against these narratives when we hear them, narratives that we for years just used to take and quietly accept, especially when they came from people that we trusted. Any of you that have sat in university classes and developed relationships with some of these, you know, feminist scholars, scholars that were, you know, often considered almost mother figures to some. It's hard to actually accept that the material that they're actually referencing is highly problematic. It can be hard to accept that. But when you actually look at the data, and this is why I think the, you know, kind of intellectual revolutionary revolution that Dr. Curry, myself, uh, Green Gorilla, Dr. Ronald Neal and a number of others are trying to push is to really use evidence 
to situate and historically contextualize where these arguments are coming from. And actually look at the ways they impact black folks. Shout out to Dr. Thunder. He as well is part of that enterprise. Right. What's up, uh, Rodney? What's going on? Right. This push to make sense of black reality beyond assumption, beyond just baseless accusation. And it really helps us to understand this right here. Right? This entitlement. This lone woman narrative where black men becomes these monstrous, you know, these monstrous beings that they have to survive. And the very idea that black men can find themselves in a vulnerable position, unthinkable. We have to get to the reality of what black men are living. And that's one of the reasons I appreciate you all in the comments, most especially because one of the things I notice y'all will do is you'll start telling stories about the things you've experienced. And I think it's important. It's imperative that those stories be told, those stories be written, those stories be published, whatever means you have of telling your story and providing evidence for it. You guys know who watched my channel in the last few months. I've, I've interviewed black men who've gone through, you know, intimate partner violence in their relationships. And I support the push to have that video evidence made public and definitely used in court cases. Because without it, the popular narratives that people like Samuel Cartwright were happy to proffer about black men take hold. Whether you're talking about juries, judges, lawyers, they have no problem seeing black men as monsters. That image has been constructed over generations. So to actually have black men pushing back with evidence about how they're treated, imperative. And just like Amber Heard with Johnny Depp, what does she tell him? Nobody's going to believe you. There are pl plenty of people that take advantage of the idea that black men are monsters and victimize and, and, and harm black men on the basis that nobody will believe that they actually weren't monsters that didn't initiate violence. It's time we push back against these narratives. It's time we challenge them with information and accurate data. Because this shit has been going way too long. Way too long. It needs to change. And this is one of the reasons I salute y'all because the brothers that I see in here uh, will email me about uh, debates that they're having in other circles, whether it's in families, whether it's online, whether it's at the job, whether it's in classes. I got grad students reaching out to me trying to find out how they can actually begin to get more publications and they themselves publish material in line with black men's experiences. We're experiencing a renaissance of sorts of black men and people are hating to hear it. People are literally frustrated about having to listen to black men. And it's interesting to see, right? Um, let me see. I don't think... I'm never really clear on what I can actually show without getting uh, my videos taken down. Let me see if I can play a little bit of this. Somebody sent me this earlier today. This is a video by a young Caucasian male who, let me see, I know what I'll do. I'll show it on screen this way. So you can kind of see him here. This is a YouTube video. All right. And so uh, let's see, I'll play him a little bit. So you can hear, I'm not going to play the whole thing because his voice is frankly annoying, but I want you to hear the level of frustration. And I'll tell you why this is relevant in a moment, but here we go. Okay. Hi, Lon. Y'all know how it is. Too many things going on all at once. Let me get the sound right so you can hear it. So it starts with a clip. That's actually a clip from another show. And then he responds to it. Deal with a, a woman that's over 200. All right, I get it. 
I get it. I promise. I got it the first time. I got it the second time. I got it the third time. How many goddamn podcasts do we need? A some man coming up in here and telling me what he likes to suck and what he likes to fuck. Completely unprovoked. Nobody asked. I just see these goddamn videos on my For You page. Every time I press not interested, I scroll away. I press not interested. I scroll away. You come back for more. You won't leave me the fuck alive. I'm sick and tired. The women you're talking about are tired. The women you're not talking about are tired. The men in the back are tired. Shit, the non-binary people are asleep. We all want to go home and you will not fucking let us it is june 2022 and we were still doing this shit what is it that you need exactly what what do i have to do for you to leave me alone did i was it me did i come up to you with a glock and tell you to go put your penis in that single mother over there or i'm gonna shoot i don't recall doing that at any point you don't want to sleep with these women don't like i don't what do you want me to tell you do you want me to some (sighs) so Basically, this was a post sent to me on Facebook by this uh, Caucasian dude, skinny dude, who's talking about how frustrated he is about listening to all these videos about black women and black men's uh, dating and mating choices. But the reason I play this is because it was a black woman on Facebook that posted it. And in the title of it, as she put it, was we are all tired, right? With a whole bunch of emojis, right? And so what I said is, I'm not quite sure what this white dude has to do with the issue, but y'all think... You're tired of black men stating their preferences in the last year as if we've always done that. Trust me, that's a new thing. I said, if you're tired, then imagine how tired we are. 40 years of talk shows, magazine articles, TV shows, movies, so-called academic papers and presentations highlighting everything from slanderous myths about absent black fathers to black men needing to make six figures and be in perfect shape to even be worthy of being considered for dates. You've had one year of a small percentage of brothers in social media saying this, but we've endured 40 in the mainstream. Please stop it, right? But my point in bringing up all of that is that you're starting to hear people frustrated with having to hear black men for the first time. And they are just as, fra- uh, just as frustrated at hearing these new dating arguments that black men are making as they are hearing Dr. Tommy Curry and Dr. T. Hassan Johnson talking about black male studies. Whether we're talking about it in the academy, on social media, the same frustration is at the base of it. They don't want to hear it. And why don't they want to hear it? Because black men have been traditionally silent. We've accepted their criticisms. We've we've literally consumed their bile for decades in silence. And after getting a little bit of pushback, there's already a problem because they're not used to it. I keep telling people, even Kevin Samuels, as much as they hate him, what is it, two years? Two years on YouTube. As if he's had some career as extensive as Oprah's. But this is what we're looking at. And black men are finally starting to speak up. And here's the thing. It's not a question of what I agree with or don't agree with. For me, it's a question of black men having the right to do so. Not just the legal right, but the actual right within the community to voice what they've been silenced from voicing for generations. Shamed into silence, told to be quiet, told to accept criticisms about them with no response. And not only told to do so by parental figures, uh, authority figures in families, but even authority figures in university classrooms. Telling us what our humanity is and isn't. While basing their arguments in very old data that has nothing to do with anything historically accurate. And we've accepted it. Mostly in silence. I can't tell you how many black male scholars reach out to me to thank me for my work and tell me what they agree with and send me additional information but they themselves can't say anything publicly for fear of losing their careers, not their jobs, losing their careers. So at the end of the day, we need to keep this pushing for the sake of truth, not for the sake of rage, not for the sake of revenge, but for the sake of accuracy, for the sake of the voiceless generations of black men that had to take this shit in silence and be quiet. We got to speak up for our sons so that they don't have to inherit this uh, inherit this unnecessary silence. Shout out to Jay Will, because then their stepdaddy insurance policy is being ripped to shreds. It wasn't a problem until we started taking inventory of our lives. Indeed, I grew up in the era of the stepfather. I don't know if you meant it this way, but I grew up in the era of the where there was almost a, an expectation that black men be stepfathers. The first time in my life I ever heard a man say I don't necessarily want to be with a woman with kids was like. You know, a handful of years ago, maybe six, seven years ago. I never heard that before. And it's not about liking it or disliking it, agreeing or disagreeing. It's about the fact that we were shamed into not being able to even say it. And so I'm liking the fact that there's this renaissance of black male voice 
and I think it's past due. Shout out to Prince Donnie for the support. All right, says the Black Woman Trans Alliance is becoming more obvious. Yeah, these kind of things are. For black men calling it out on a variety of levels, coming from a, diff a variety of different ideological, uh, ideological positions, different class positions, all of it is important. Black male voices need to be heard on a wide variety of topics because it really hasn't been. We've been told what our opinions are. And others have used uh, black women, most particularly, to speak on our behalf, especially when it comes to electoral politics. And black men are starting to question their options in a variety of different contexts. And again, I'm for the right to, for black men to do so. So I appreciate y'all. Not going to hold you too long. I do apologize for going this late. I'll try and keep it earlier. Um, but this is what we're dealing with. So shout out to Dr. Tommy Curry. Shout out to all of y'all who support Black Male Studies, who, should, who support the Manosphere, who support uh, the Onyx Report. I appreciate you. Make sure you comment so I can check out what you guys are thinking. And please continue to send me information, send me stories, so on and so forth. Um, if you think it's important, you think it's something we need to deal with, I'm happy to get it. Uh, just make sure, again, if you're sending video, uh, that's time consuming. So give me a timestamp and let me know what in it you want me to see. But it's much appreciated. Keep speaking up. Keep pushing back. Peace.